I don't think so. Right, now, I can, now I can't tell what that's looking like. That should be fine. Give me a sign now. Oh, nothing, nothing new. Uh, uh, I'll take care of communion and offering. So the goal is to have nobody get out of their cars. So we're trying to. I know we're. I understand that, and I'm not worried about it. But if somebody drives by and wants to make a fuss about us meeting, they'd be a perfect way for them to do it. That's why I'm worried. About it. Even if it's not doing anything, at least it looks like it is. So, so very good. Um, so he's gonna make an announcement, but that box is gonna be over there. forget about the uh
that's all right. I don't know that it does. No, don't. Oh, oh, oh. Don't break it. I don't know. I mean, if, yeah, I I don't know if they would blow off or not. He said 94.7. I'm going to pull forward and back up a little straighter so I can make art more nervous. <laughs>
said that by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. result in 
praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. This is the word of the Lord. Hallelujah. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. Hallelujah. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Hallelujah. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the 16th chapter. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands in his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold the forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Now Thomas, one of the twelve called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will not believe. Eight days later his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, and see my hands, and put out your hand, and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve it, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen, and yet have believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. This is the gospel of our Lord. Having received the gospel of our Lord, we confess our Christian faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible. And in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all the worlds, God of God, light of light, very God to very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men, and for our salvation, who came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit in the Virgin Mary. mercy and peace be to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. St. James wrote, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. 
Now the most complacent of individuals must now admit that we are in a trial unlike anything in living memory. And for some, this tests their faith. It strains it. And for some, it may even be a breaking point. St. Peter wrote his first epistle to an expanding early church with growing pains. Those people were faced with many issues, community issues. How do you build a community of believers when Christianity is persecuted? Mission issues. If we can't get our own house in order, how do we witness Christ to those who have not heard? Suffering, anxiety and tension, physical and mental challenges. Many of those early Christians became isolated because others in their family have shunned them. Some lived in fear of persecution by the Jews. Among all of those situations, Peter brought a message of faith and hope. Now we have a lot in common with those early Christians. And Peter's message of hope for the life, death, and resurrection of Christ for the sins of the world is also a message for you and I. Now today the church is not breaking any growth records. In fact, conservative and confessional churches are in decline. We have the opposite problem as those churches that Peter wrote to. But our testing in our time of trial is identical. It makes sense that the saints that are on this extreme path share the same emotional roller coaster as we. Now, the early Christians bounced between a sincere and abiding hope in the Lord's promises and falling into a pit of hopelessness. And we can relate to that in our own time. Doesn't it ever seem to you that during the festival half of the church here, Christmas, Easter, find ourselves more appreciative of God's gifts, more aware of our sins and our need to repent, and that it is with hope and joy that we confess those sins and enjoy the divine medicine of holy absolution and the Lord's Supper. But don't we also find when the summer months roll around in that beautiful weather, when we start planning vacations and other activities, and sometimes that renewed faith gets pushed into a dark corner, maybe a little bit. Then when it's all said and done, when trial strikes, our spiritual laziness can cause us to doubt God's promises. We may even wonder why God is punishing us. And while things are motoring wrong, we might not even reserve a spot in our attention for the activities that belong to God. And then it is all the more painful when great trial or tragedy strikes. And it comes as a big surprise to us out of nowhere. Now we know that reborn into the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, there is no reason for hopelessness. But we sinfully forget that sometimes. We try to climb out of our predicaments on our own. trying to stay hopeful through our own willpower. That becomes exhausting. We don't turn to the words of Christ. It eventually becomes impossible. And then when our efforts fail, our hopelessness becomes malignant. It eats all of our positivity. Now we can't miss 
some, the final step comes just as we despair of one problem only to have another one come right behind. And setback after setback threatens to erode our faith. And it turns hope into fear. The sin of hopelessness keeps rearing its ugly head. St. Peter saw that hopelessness in his flock. And the Holy Spirit guided him to write a letter to boost their faith and to boost ours. Describing feelings of hopelessness can be very difficult. It's as though you're moving through a dense fog or trying to push a rope. Nothing seems to work, but there is a solution. In the ancient world, gold was refined by melting it down in a furnace and letting the impurities float to the top, which were then skimmed off and discarded. And actually, it's not that much different today. The same thing is true of our faith during a time of testing. Times of trial reforges our faith, and it discards the obstacles to belief. Look at Job. God unquestionably put Job through trials. All of his livestock and all of his employees died. His wife and all of his children died while he was sitting at the dinner table with them. Then finally he was stricken with sores and disease. And he sat in sackcloth in ashes, crying out to God. And his friends sat with him for a time, and even they gave up on him that his bad luck might rub off on them. But through all of that, Job never cursed God. Did he question God? Absolutely. Did he seek clarification of why this was happening? 100% yes. But never a curse. Job remained steadfast in his faith, a faith that we can look to as an example for our lives. Job said, I know that the way I take, when he has tried me, I shall come out as gold. That's an unshakable faith. That's an affirmation that we should make ours. The Lord God said through his prophet Isaiah, Behold, I have refined you, but not as silver. I have tried you in the furnace of affliction. What trials did those early Christians face? Having to beat in secret.
be found to result in praise and glory and honor in the revelation of Jesus Christ. The strength from which this new hope, this new faith draws, is none other than Christ himself, and the hope we have in his atoning sacrifice for us on the cross. Faith, like gold refined in fire, shines brighter and purer, and it becomes our witness to the world. In that same way, let your light so shine among men, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Now our leaders, state and federal levels, are going to begin discussing how to end this exile. And while we continue to go through this time, we can start to understand what Martin Luther called the right way to do theology. And he had three fancy Latin terms for it. Ratio, meditatio, and tentatio. Prayer, meditation, and temptation, or trial. With our sins forgiven and our hope in the resurrection, we've received access through faith, through the hope, for the hope of God's glory. And we pray and we meditate on God's work in our lives. We become tested as if in a refining fire. The devil tries to do his thing, the world tries to do its thing on us. But even this time of trial will come to an end. So we can rejoice in our sufferings because they show us even more than usual the great mercies and love that God has shown us. And so refined by that fire, we can truly confess that suffering produces endurance. Endurance produces character. Character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame. Because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us in the name of Jesus. Amen.
for which he was to be praised with bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, gave it to his disciples, saying, Take it, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.